Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Cruikshank. I'm the Program Manager at the BIA. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar, Preparing for Clinical Trial in a Novel Therapeutic Area, in collaboration with our Charity Partner of the Year, RNID. Uh, if you have the next slide, please. Uh, for those who don't know, the BIA is proud to represent more than 600 member organisations, primarily life science SMEs. We are the voice for the innovative life sciences and biotech industry, enabling and connecting the UK ecosystem so that businesses can start, grow and deliver world-changing innovation. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, we're delighted to be collaborating with RNID this year as our charity partner of the year. Um, so far, this has included working together at the BIA Gala Dinner, uh, the Step Up Fundraising Initiative, and we're also showcasing hearing loss research initiatives through blogs and webinars like this one, and helping our members develop inclusive practices for those with hearing loss. Um, as a note, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available online afterwards. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Ralph at RNID, who can give more background on RNID and introduce today's panel. Hi, 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 hi everyone, and, and thanks, um, um, Sam. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to this afternoon's um, webinar. Um, RNID is delighted to be the BIA's um, charity of the year. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, so, so RNID is the national charity in the UK supporting the 18 million people in the UK who are deaf, um, have hearing loss or tinnitus. Um, and through our partnership with the BIA this year, um, we want to accelerate the progress being made towards life-changing treatments for hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, and we also want to make sure that the bio industry sector is a more inclusive workplace um, for people who are deaf or have um, hearing loss. Um, next slide, please. So, so please um, do get in touch by um, clicking on the um, QR code, following the link in the QR code, um, and that will take you to some information um, where you can find out more about how we can help you make your workplace more inclusive for people with hearing loss. Um, and also importantly, um, more information about our Hearing Therapeutics Initiative, um, which can help connect you to the know-how, resources, um, information and help that you need in order to explore opportunities around um, hearing therapeutics, which we're going to hear about um, during the course of this afternoon's um, webinar. So it's a really exciting um, time for our communities, for people with hearing loss, and, and it's a really exciting time for the hearing research field um, with you know, drug and gene therapies now entering clinical trials. So, so the goal of the webinar this afternoon is to really shine a spotlight on clinical trials of hearing therapeutics um, and share the learning that I'm sure is going to be relevant to companies working in other um, novel therapeutic um, areas. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mahal Patel, um, who is Vice President um, of Respiratory Clinical Development at AstraZeneca, um, who's kindly going to chair this afternoon's um, webinar. Thank you, Ralph, um, and thank you to the BIA and to the RNID for asking me to be involved in this panel. Um, so uh, as Ralph said, uh, I'm the Vice President of Respiratory Clinical Development at AstraZeneca. My background is that uh, I'm a board certified pulmonologist and internal medicine physician, um, but conducted some trials um, with biologics in clinical development and subsequently moved to industry and our leading a team uh, of clinical development uh, in the respiratory space at AstraZeneca. I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel. Uh, we've got Kate Blackstone, Anna Schilder, and Vasily Van Eliopoulos, who will ask us to uh, introduce themselves before we go into some detailed discussion. Starting off with Kate, please. Hi, everyone. Kate Blackstone. So my current job is Charity Engagement Lead for the NIHR. Uh, but I've just come off the back of 10 years in the NHS running clinical research facilities um, and delivering phase one first in human dose escalation advanced therapy trials a lot and working under phase one, MHRA phase one accreditation. Thanks. Just on, yeah, there you go. Yeah. I'm Anna Schilder. I am uh, an ENT surgeon and epidemiologist. I'm based at 
uh, UCL in London, where I lead a translational hearing research program for um, the NIHR BRC. I guess I'm up next. Hi, everyone. My name is Vasily Valayanopoulos. I'm an executive director and clinical program lead for auditory sciences for Regeneron. My training is um, I'm, I'm a M certified MD and PhD in um, clinical genetics with focus on pediatric genetics and pediatric neurology. And I come with a 20 years plus experience in the domain of rare diseases. And my, my last five years I've dedicated in uh, industry sponsored programs, uh, gene therapy for various rare disease companies. Very excited to be here with you all. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, very excited to have you all here and to engage in this discussion. I'm going to start off with Anna uh, and then Vasily in that order and um, hopefully go through your biggest challenge when planning and conducting clinical trials in this area. It's a very novel therapeutic area. Um, so how did you go about planning to tackle these challenges? So Anna, first, please. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it's been quite a, an exciting journey. I, I was uh, leading um, what was the first trial of a regenerative hearing drug um, at the time, which was in 2017. So there was no template for um, doing any trials in, in hearing regeneration. And I think the biggest challenge was to, um, to select the right patients for our study. And this was because um, the hearing tests we currently have available, they can show us the level of hearing loss and they can also show us whether there's a problem uh, in the middle of the inner ear, but they can't really tell us what the underlying cause of hearing loss is. Is this, uh, for example, a loss of hair cells or of the nerve cells, or is it the synapses between the two? And, and having knowledge about this is, is really critical because the, the, the treatments we are developing, the novel therapeutics, um, target a very specific pathway or protein in the inner ear. And because we, we struggle to characterize our patient population as such, we may actually miss or dilute an effect of our uh, very targeted drug. And um, uh, we haven't completely resolved that. There is a, there is a lot of research ongoing on, on developing better tests that can uh, uh, and, and better biomarkers of, of, of hearing loss, but they haven't really been clinically validated yet. And um, I think it, it's much less of a problem as we've seen in the gene therapy studies where we include people with a very specific gene mutation. Uh, so we're much more confident what the cause of hearing loss is and, and maybe Vasily can, can tell a bit more about that. Yeah, sure, I can, I can share our, our own experience. So first of all, we are developing AV-based gene therapies for various genetic conditions of hearing loss. So the first one we've chosen is not the most frequent one and is not the easiest one. It's a very rare genetic condition um, related to mutations of the autoferlin gene. And so one of the biggest challenges was uh, being able to identify these patients because unfortunately, and um, conversely to other rare genetic diseases, there's not a universal newborn screening based on genetic testing. And the testing methods very often miss this, these patients because they have a phenotype of auditory neuropathy and some of the methods can miss this patient. So challenging to find them, challenging to uh, fully diagnose them. And then once this is done, they need to fulfill some, some criteria, right? And so some of them um, have already received intervention um, such as cochlear implantation that as you know, for this, this type of, of gene therapy approach. So it's a challenge to find. Then I would say the second um, difficulty beyond you know, being, being able to diagnose these, these patients is also the whole delivery system in the inner ear. Um, most of the AV gene therapies, the ones that are commercialized or the ones in clinical trials, and we're talking about, you know, 
a several dozens of clinical trials, they all deliver systemically. It's relatively easy. It's an IV injection, right? You don't have to figure out what kind of device you're gonna use that, what kind of pump. We are injecting in the inner ear, directly into the cochlea, right? So you have to figure the route you're gonna use for that. Uh, you need to make sure you're not gonna be traumatic when you're doing this. And then you need to figure out everything from the catheter you're gonna use the duration of the infusion and all these parameters that you know can can influence positively or or negatively the outcome of your clinical trial and then you have the usual progression through dose selections and and trying to mitigate all these things at the same time so of course it's it's a pioneering endeavor and all these learnings will will help the development of future gene therapies for the interior but you know, being the first in this space for ourselves and all the other companies that are investing in this same rare genetic indication, there are a lot of challenges, but also a lot of learnings from, from this first experience. Thank you, both of you. That sounds very exciting and, and very novel. Um, certainly interesting to be injecting the inner ear. And that, that brings me to my next question, I guess. Um, clearly involving specialists with expert knowledge and expertise such as Anna is important, but how do both of you deal with recruitment considerations of what seems like now a rare disease with specialist technical requirements? Clearly recruitment considerations are really important in commercial trials, so maybe both of you can, can talk about that and how that also maps to other disease areas. Yeah, I, I think when we started our a uh, regain trial of a regenerative hearing drug we targeted people with uh, with age related hearing loss who who ideally had lost their hair cells and their synapses and at the time we were concerned um, would people with hearing loss even be interested in in joining a trial with in fact an experimental treatment but what we luckily experienced that we were inundated literally with requests uh, for people worldwide to to take part in in uh, in our trial. And, and I still get emails every day from families and uh, patients from all over the world say, can I please take part in a study? What what's becoming available in the in, in the future? And, and I think what it really shows that um, hearing loss is still very much an unmet clinical need. So there's really room for improvement uh, because the treatments that we give nowadays, hearing aids or cochlear implants, they're really, they've been really transformational in, in helping people. But the problem is they, they make sound louder, but they don't make it clearer. So in the situations where you need them most, for example, when you want to hear a conversation it's a no in a noisy environment, they're actually not such a great help. So people are really interested and, and, and really willing uh, to join these trials to see if there is another solution that may actually restore their natural hearing or slow progression of hearing loss. Uh, I think people are quite realistic. They don't expect an immediate um transformation back to normal but they say if you could slow the progression of my hearing loss so that also i could benefit for longer from for example a particular hearing aid we we would really be interested uh, in that so so i think that's that's an important um learning that people are very very willing to take part i think um there is work to be done for us to also uh, engage with clinicians um, who are seeing these people on a day-to-day -day basis. So they also understand uh, what these novel treatments may actually offer in the future and therefore, you know, whether they would be willing to refer patients for clinical trials and such. But the patient themselves, they really want to take part. Thank you. And Vasily, do you have any builds on that? Yes, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the clinician network. So when we started the concept of this AV gene delivery in the inner ear, so we looked for specialists and experts that had the surgical expertise for that delivery in the inner ear. And we spent a lot of time of them thinking about a delivery method that could be universally applied. We did not aim to create a very sophisticated delivery device 
that could be only operated in the hands of a few experts around the world. We wanted to build a surgical approach that would be accessible to any ENT surgeon that is experienced with cochlear implantation. So that was the basis of how we've built our delivery method. And so that allows us to partner with key centers, not only that see the patients, but you know, perform a lot of surgeries on this type of patients per, per year. So for them, transitioning to a surgical delivery from surgical, let's say, implantation of a cochlear implant was, was a very natural progression. And so a lot of our um, partners in this uh, development work for us as consultants or participate in our advisory board, became later our principal investigators in clinical trials. So that, that natural progression also happened between people who advise on how to do it and then got to do it themselves. Uh, so, so that's the, the first part. The second part is, I think we, we, sometimes we underestimate the value of some early successes. And personally, I was never keen on, you know, putting the first participants on the front of the scene to share that experience, because as we all know, you know, it can go well on the first one, then can go less well on the, the other one. But when we are in such novel spaces, an early success, especially if it's a success that can be life transforming for, 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 for young children, it has a lot of power and a lot of value. And clearly when this happened for our first participant, and it was similar for other clinical trial, was some of the participants shared these experiences publicly in the media, it created much more trust and confidence for other families and patients. And remember, these are patients of very young children, right, that are facing options that are established, and then they have this opportunity to participate in a clinical research, right? And I, I think that those first experiences and sharing some some early positive data were very, very helpful in spreading the news and, and allowing, you know, to, to get more buy-in for by, by future participants who might be a bit more hesitant at the beginning. What I've also, just if I may add to that, um, so... I think what we have been um, trying to push quite a bit over the past decade is for our discovery scientists to maybe be a bit more courageous uh, because I think as clinicians, we, we see the clinical need. We, we see how, um, how patients really would like better treatments. And what that means is, is that I think, um, you know, you can stay in the lab forever, <laughs> um, but at some times, you know, you need to make that transition and, and, and prove that a treatment is safe. Uh, and, and I think, um, and, and that will, that, because that's the only way to progress the field, to develop new treatments, it's to make that first step. And I think what I what I see within my own institute is that that uh, people are really really impressed with the results of the of the gene therapy trials, and it really motivates them to also you know think about translation of their discovery. So I, I see not only from the families and perhaps investors, which is really, really important, but also from the discovery scientists. So hopefully we'll get all these bright minds to work on translation rather than on discovery or both ideally, <laughs> yeah. That, really that's, a great, that's a great point. So, so I'm hearing that um, understanding the patient pathway, the disease pathway, having networks and collaborations with appropriate specialists and centers, but also patient networks is also important. I'd like to bring in Kate here, who may have another perspective based on her experience across geographies uh, and sites. So, so Kate, can you can you bring in your thoughts on how how we're recruiting? Um, so yeah, so I think it's quite interesting. I I am new to the hearing area, but I think there's some generic and kind of transferable issues around infrastructure that enables diverse participation, um, and it's around. So we have this 
great infrastructure in the country. We have clinical research facilities, biomedical research centers together and aligned and, and that translation and gap of the, that. But it's how are we getting those patients to the centers? So the NHS is research active, that's great. We've got patient populations, but we still have our underserved communities um, and that engagement and having where they be seen as appropriate. So um, part of it's around really informed site selection. So making sure that you've got the clinical expertise, the surgical delivery team in the right place, the right workforce that is skilled in the new early phase um, trials, the emergency preparedness around that. So should something go wrong, everyone's got the right skills to address the emergency. So having the, the site selection also be a hospital that's got capacity should something go wrong. So acute beds, um, but acute critical care beds in that space. Um, so having that right site selection that suits the patients, they're in the right place, we can access them, but also having to be able to be supportive in the delivery once it's there. Um, but I think the interaction between investigators, um, the NHS and maybe charities is that kind of bit of where we can get those new patients, get... We sort of think quite often as charities as like the brokers, the people who are trusted and thinking about how we leverage them into our recruitment plans and making sure we're getting the messaging out and we're finding the right patients, not just clinically, but the patients so we can get that full scope of those who want to participate where there is that unmet need. So I think thinking greater of this collaboration between the academics, between the NHS, between the sponsor and with charities to kind of find those new patients and bring them in. I agree, and that's something we've um, always uh, we've done several times with uh, working with with uh, RNID, um, and and we've seen, as I said, we get a lot of requests from people to uh, see if they can take part in the clinical trial, and a lot of people come through the um, RNID website. Um, so those, the, you're absolutely right. Those recruitment strategies involving the the charities are, are really really important. No, I agree. No. It makes per perfect sense. Sorry, someone's going to come in. Is it Vasily? Yes, I wanted to add to this that from an industry perspective, I, I think all the companies realize the, the importance of the patient, well, we call them patient advocacy groups in the US, but I guess it's the same that we're talking about the same thing. And now most of the sponsors and clinical research field engage early on and more often patient advocacy groups, and even boards of patient and families ad as advisors to their clinical plans. And I think that patient-centric approach is um, contributing to a better designed trial, a more, more meaningful outcomes, and also more palatable uh, trials for, for participants, which is important also. You can build the perfect trial, but it could be so burdensome that no one would want to stay on the trial for more than a year. And so that's that perspective is, is very, very valuable. And I believe most sponsors now like to integrate it early on in their clinical trial designs. Yeah, I think in the, in the UK, we call that patient and public involvement, which is, is, is a requirement uh, currently for every funder uh, to have patients and families involved in, in designing your trial. Uh, and also as part of the um, the actual steering group and 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 the trial trial management groups and it's interesting because in our trial it it um, we engaged with with patients about the delivery and uh, because our drug had to be uh, delivered in the middle ear um, with the aim for it to be uh, diluted into into the inner ear uh, through the round window and. Um, we initially felt that we were going to uh, put the drug into a gel surgically uh, with lifting up the eardrum and putting it in place. Um, and the patient said, "Well, we are, you know, we we we're willing to take part in a in in this in this uh, phase one study, but I really don't want an operation. I'd I'd rather you give me an injection." through the eardrum. So we really tried, we changed our trial design 
based upon on that uh, on that input of, of patients and families. So we deliver the drug through an injection through the eardrum. Whether in hindsight that was a good decision is is something else, but it, they really informed uh, how we how we delivered the trial. I, I agree. We have to put the patient at the center of what we're doing because we're developing these therapies for the patient. I mean, you bring in another thought into my mind when you speak, Anya, and I, I, I bring this back to Kate because instrumentation in, in a pandemic era and these studies that may not have been intercepted during those periods, but we do think COVID's had some impact on clinical trials. Kate, have we had any learning from that or any thoughts of how COVID in the post-pandemic era has evolved? Um, how COVID's evolved or how trial, running trials has evolved? Tra in, running trials in the post-pandemic era. Um, I think you could probably spend three webinars talking about that. Um, I think there's around, one of the things we see, if we link it back to the conversation around recruitment. So one of the things we see is how far are people willing to travel for trials? So there is, there's sort of two sides to that point. One is clinical unmet need people will travel as far as possible and sponsors can help by making sure there's a really reasonable and good and appropriate travel expense accommodation covered up front without people paying out so that everyone of all socioeconomic levels can participate and that's not going to be a barrier that's one side people will travel but there are other people you know outside the hearing area but in other neural therapies if anyone has anything affecting their immune system we see a drop of people willing to travel for research they're worried about exposure there are still people who are shielding there is guidance out there but there are still people who are concerned about this pandemic or what pandemic x is so we have this fine line between how far someone is willing to travel and where that's going to be so the conversations since covid have been around decentralizing research where can we do research beyond the the acute hospital Obviously, when you're talking about surgical delivery um, of the IMP, that's only going to be able to be in certain centres. So it's, again, going back to that patient population and having that conversation of how far are you going to be willing to travel? Potentially, it's you do the you do screening decentralised. Maybe you dose in an acute centre. You do follow up decentralised. So I think we see a growth in kind of... Um, innovative trial design, but not just in the protocol design, but in the delivery mechanism. And what in my experience we see a lot of is where you have a very special service that might be oversubscribed that is required for the trial, you actually get centres collaborating with other centres to deliver the trial as well. So whether that's a way of harvesting, so if you're looking more into cell therapies and you're looking at harvesting raw material, leukophoresis, you know, that if you're working in that space, I think talking on the other side of talking to the patients is talking to the centres really early to say, what might you need to do in terms of infrastructure and do we need to put some collaborations in up front? And what I've seen since COVID is more willingness to be really collaborative. Um, and so that's been a bit of a step change. And before I moved over to the NIHR, I had several advanced therapy trials on my books where we were talking about working in collaboration with other centres to deliver our first in human trials. Thank you. Um, I picked up on something else you mentioned before, Kate, which is uh, diversity in clinical trials, which we'll all recognise is very important. Even regulators consider this important. So, Vasily, could you tell us a little bit about the regulatory path there? Because this is a novel area to me in phase one, two. Yes, absolutely. I think this also uh, speaks back to the COVID era. So we, the regulatory agencies actually made efforts and realized that you don't have to spend five years, you know, to develop a new drug, right, which was the usual path. You know, you would have to do a phase one study, healthy volunteers, then move into patients, you know, make some learnings out of this initial trial, select a dose possibly, and then move into a registration confirmatory trial. So we saw more and more openness to go into seamless designs where you can combine phase one, two, three in one, especially for rare conditions where you know that, you know, you want to build up on the early experiences. You cannot 
neglect these early experiences in in patients because you might not end up finding a lot to to be able you know to confirm your 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 results so i think that's a mindset that at least I, I see a lot with the FDA, probably with some regulatory authorities also in, in Europe. And I personally find MHRA has been very supportive on some of these, these aspects to accelerate development, especially for um, investigational products that address high end med needs and have early promising results. So certainly I see I see change in that. Now, for the diversity aspects, I think the, the sponsors do want that, right? Because they are going to be catering to a large population of patients around the world, right? All these um, investigational drugs are bound to become medications that will be globally distributed. So it's it's more and more integrated and in, in interesting early on to, to have a diverse population but also to make sure that, you know, because these are people with unmet need, there's also a sense of um, equity and equality on, on what we do, because for, for many of these participants, it will represent a significant change in, in their lives. And so I think these are, these are aspects that are now not overlooked or, or neglected anymore in maybe 10 years. It was on, in nobody's minds. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think um, you already mentioned about the importance of bringing translational science in early, understanding disease mechanisms, which certainly is something that I, I recognize. Vasily, I'm sure you'd also see the relevance of that as you build your regulatory path. So in somewhere where we've got a, a rarish condition and, and someone like me is still learning from, from you as we speak, what type of outcome measures are important here and how do you go about mapping that? And that's a question to you, Anna, first of all. Yeah, I think on, on the matter of outcome measures, I think that that relates very much to the topic about patient characterization as well, about, about phenotyping. And um, in terms of outcome measures, the, the hearing tests that we use in clinical practice, they, they've been around forever. Uh, pure tone audiometry in a soundproof booth. We measure the the the, the hearing the hearing threshold, and um, uh, we have speech testing, uh, which of course is 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 a challenge when you translate a trial across different countries because we all have different languages and we have different speech tests. But um, we with those tests, as I just mentioned we they may not be the best biomarkers to use in an early phase efficacy trial because they are they've been developed validated for big clinical changes the other thing what they, they these tests have been developed and validated in people whose hearing um, got worse over time or whose hearing was damaged through noise or uh, ototoxic medication and we actually don't really have many examples about how do we measure hearing improvement and, and, and what is a meaningful improvement in early phase trials. And, and I think that's something we have learned that in hindsight, we, we were a bit too ambitious in what we felt uh, was a meaningful difference and and uh, other investigators have encountered the same and it means that although you see changes um, because you've set your primary endpoint a bit too high based upon your enthusiasm and, and in a sense lack of experience from other trials you may miss your primary endpoint which is which is um, uh, something we're of, of course rapidly um, catching up with uh, uh, as these, uh, this whole field is is progressing. And um, I think that's, um, I mean, that's the great thing we've seen in the um, gene therapy trials is that um, even with relatively conventional testing, um, well, I think the efficacy signals have been so impressive that they would have been picked up with any test uh, and that's been that's been really really wonderful 
That's very encouraging and great to hear. And, and I hear what you're saying in that it's hard to identify what's meaningful change if you've not had previously had an intervention that results in these outcomes before. So, so that makes a lot of sense that bringing back in the patient perspective, again, is highly relevant. So I guess on the other side of the coin, we, we've talked about some real positives and this does seem a very exciting area. What, what's not worked? What's not worked as well as it could have? Maybe I can chime in in the auditory space as they have been a few failures recently and basically these just failures. before you carry on Vasily, I, I just noticed we haven't had many comments in the Q&A so for the audience please do ask any questions in the Q&A sorry to interrupt Vasily. no worries I would say there have been some some recent failures in the hearing space and and actually they they, they led to uh, entire companies falling apart and I think it ties back to what Anna was was the point she was making is that sometimes the the endpoints were designed or the trials were designed with efficacy endpoints that were too ambitious, right? Or that would involve many more participants than what these trials were able to enroll. And and I think that's that's challenging because as I was saying earlier, often in in in, in an effort like this, you have one shot. Right. If it fails, it fails. And unfortunately, it's rare that someone else wants to pick up where someone previously failed. Um, so I think that's that's one challenge. And but back to the previous point, I wanted to add that it, in my mind, we need to move away from the conventional ways of testing. So, of course, you know, the hearing tests. Uh, for, for hearing loss have been there forever. They're very good diagnostic, prognostic indicators. But at some point, we need to integrate other things such as quality of life, such as, you know, narratives that come directly from the participants. How was it before the intervention? How is it now after the intervention? And I can tell you I've had experience in other gene therapy trials with this kind of thing. And you're getting so valuable feedback and information that no functional test is able to, to capture. And if you don't ask the question, you'll never get this, this kind of response. And I think because the regulators are so much attached, not only to changes in numerical values, but they want also to see how patients feel, function. You know, They want to make sure that the investigation drugs that we're putting forward have a real impact in, in, in patients' way of feeling things or performing outside specific tests. And so I think there's there's a lot of room for including new this new type of endpoint in, in our clinical trials. I think that makes a lot of sense. And to your point, the, the, there's usually a body of evidence that's needed across a, a wealth of efficacy um, signals to show that something's a compelling treatment, not just for regulators, but also for the people who have to end up paying for the for the product of the back end. So, so, so completely hear what you're saying and, and, and agree with that. Um, what, what's the future in this disease area? What, what are the next steps? Well, I think with, at the moment we are riding the wave of the um, su initial success of the gene therapy trials, which is incredibly exciting because as Vasily just mentioned some of the uh, pharmaceutical approaches for the reasons I've just described um, have not um, been as successful as, as we had hoped so there's a lot of work to be done but we are learning and I think we're just getting better and better and yes in, in, in terms of, of the future I think with that success of the gene therapy trials we will see a lot more interest it, it's been difficult for a while for the field to get investors uh, involved and and um, because there are you know new therapeutic targets are being uh, discovered every day new therapeutic approaches are being trialed preclinically every day but we need those investments and you know not just the money but the people the experts to to progress forward and that process has been challenging for a bit uh and and i think um that that with the success the proof of concept that these these 
trials are, are showing, we will see people moving back into, into that arena again. And um, so in that sense, I, I think we're, we're in, a, in a very good position um, going forward. Thank you. Uh, and Kate, do you have any thoughts on, on what we could generally do to make things better for running clinical trials? Um, we've talked about patients, and I see there's a question from a patient perspective we'll bring back, but any other builds? Um, I think just on a really practical front, so I talked about before, that, yeah, this is a novel space, and whether it's the MHRA, whether it's an ethics committee, whether it's the person at site who has to give that product to the patient, you know, they the, might be the first person in the world, first person center. There is always a concern and an anxiety around managing, managing the risk and mitigating and being prepared for emergencies. And in my experience of a, in a, over about a decade of working in different organizations, what happens is people want a lot of information to plan with that. And sometimes it's not necessarily in the operational plan of a sponsor to have that document ready, but it completely slows down the process. And the more people don't know something, the more anxious they get. And that might mean at a site level, over reviewing things and, you know, that can slow the process down. So my ask is like for every site in the country kind of thing is when you site select and you submit that information pack to the site is make sure the IB, the IMPD, the pharmacy manual, the lab manual, um, all the, the imaging manual, anything that means someone can understand how they're going to do their job, get that to them as soon as possible because then they can start working up their plans and they can get something back to you. And having a really clear line to the person who can answer that question as quickly as possible is really important because every time it passes through someone, there's a little bit of Chinese whispers and it comes back through everyone and there's a little bit of Chinese whispers. And all these little things over and over just slow the process down. So one of the most complex trials I've ever worked on in a first in human, it sounds really simple, but we got the sponsor, the CRO, the CI, everyone, the, the contract person, every single person in the process at a table. And it was a very, very long list of questions, but we started to prioritize and break them through. And we kept on talking to each other right up to opening, having that SIV. It's really practical. It's not sexy in any way. Um, it's resource intensive in terms of people's time, but it meant every time we had a question at site, every time we hit a speed bump, we had a group of people we could troubleshoot it with and move it forward straight away. And we weren't going through emails. And I think that makes a real difference. And it's that kind of bringing that collaboration back in again and pulling on the expertise and making sure you find the right answer, not an over-engineered answer, but the right one to move it forward. So it's really practical, but it's something that makes a huge difference. Yeah, and ad adding to that, I think what is really imp important for this particular field is, is education. Um, because in the field of hearing loss, um, clinical trials are not common. Uh, it's not just about novel therapeutics, but I mean, we see very few trials. So there isn't a big body of experience around delivery of, of clinical trials amongst ENT surgeons and audiologists. And that means that we really need to start educating that field. And we can only do that by engaging with professional organizations that also start to educate uh, clinicians on why it is important to understand that inner ear hearing loss is not just a disease, it is actually a symptom of many underlying diseases. And up until recently, that wasn't so important, but it is becoming very important now with these novel therapeutics coming our way. So that really requires um, engaging with, with those professional bodies to educate people and then also educate people about what does it mean to, to, to run a clinical trial. And um, uh, so, and, and, and to build that, that workforce that is able to, to deliver the trials in the way that, that Kate has just described. Thank you. That, that... That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, we've mentioned 
IBs, ethics, IRBs and, and CTAs. What are your thoughts on how we could improve the clinical trial process? How can we simplify that? I can chime in. Please do. I mean, when we look at the times we, we, we put to develop them, and then we look at the times it takes for some of these bodies to review, it's unparalleled, right? So sometimes we'll put together one of these documents, let's say a new protocol within a few weeks. And clearly this day, I don't understand why it needs to take months, you know, to, to review. And, you know, sometimes just a review that will not produce any questions or anything. I can understand that some protocols can be problematic or some other study documents might need explanations. It might take a lot of back and forth to get them through. But I don't understand why the standard protocol for, for many of the health authorities needs to take two months of review time, right? So, so I think there's there's some effort that needs to happen because we're holding up, you know, basically trial execution. When we're making amendments to make the trials better, we're delaying these improvements to, to be made in a timely fashion. So in my mind, that's that's something that we need to uh, to improve. I would say also for on the sponsor side, we need to make sure, and we, we're striving for this every time, to make the documents legible, simple to understand, right? And not, you know, overload them with details that, you know, take the essence of the document outside from what it should be, right? These, these documents should be precise, concise, contain all the information, but shouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, 200 page documents every time, because that, that for sure, delays the 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 review of the processing of of, uh, of this information i echo your thoughts and i guess it's probably even harder where you've got more complex diseases because you might not have that level of expertise at the ethics board etc but uh, but i completely agree with what you're saying um is there any difference between industry sponsored trials versus academic sponsored trials I think not in particular in this domain, I don't think there's a big difference. Our our study was was in a set, it was uh, industry supported, but it was funded by the EU. Um, and, and, you know, within this particular field, we're bound to all the pharmaceutical uh, protocols and, 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 and regulations. So I, I think in a sense, uh, those processes are are are. are very much aligned. I, I don't see a big difference. And I think in, in particular in the UK, because I would like to add a, a really positive note again about the NIHR. That, that it's the NIHR, of course, it's it's the it's the research arm of the NHS. And it had put a system in place where each and every local NHS hospital can actually establish an R&D team. They can have a team of research nurses uh, and other support staff. And, and what it means that patients with, with any condition can take part in clinical trials in their local hospital, uh, no matter where they're treated. And I think in most other countries that really only happens in academic centers. And, and I think that infrastructure is, is absolutely unique to, to the UK. And it also offers the staff in the hospital, in local hospitals to contribute to research, which is really important for staff retainment. But what it means that because it's a national system, it's big it's, it's, it, and it's complex. So I think, I think we do need to continue to reflect on how do we streamline those processes, how we make them a bit more agile uh, and also perhaps a bit more cost effective from sometimes. sometimes. Thank you. I think that's a, a good moment to move to the Q&A because I've had a few come in. Now, the first one I'm going to bring to you, please, Kate, it, it's this question of how we balance what level of detail we burden the patients with versus give them enough information. And I, I recognise that challenge. Do you have any thoughts, sir? Yeah, and I think it, it's something to get very hard to get right because just as every trial is different, every response is different, every potential participant is different to what how they take information in, how they process it, and how much information they want to make a decision. Um, but I've run ethics committees in the past, um, and I've definitely been on the side of 
writing saying your information sheet needs more information or also saying god forbid this needs to be pulled back no one can no one can interpret this um so i think it goes back to that bit of we talked about at the top about engaging patient groups advisory groups charities um you know and as research moves into the care space and communities the people that have touch points with those to understand what that patient group needs in order to make that decision and while you're finding out the priorities for research i think you're also finding out what are their concerns about taking part in research so it's a two pay two side conversation what improvement do they want to see coming out of research new therapies new devices but also what concerns them because then you can actually if you are trying to be pragmatic and proportionate in the content of that information sheet you can be pulling it back to make sure that where the detail is lines up with what they're concerned about if you've got a group, group of patients who um you know prog like prognosis isn't particularly good that risk benefit burden ratio is going to be a bit different to someone who the condition isn't going to be life altering or different so i think it's finding out what they're concerned about and that's the tactic of how you can address it and then when you're presenting to the ethics committee and an ethics committee says yeah we've got we're, we're a bit worried about the information sheet you can be making sure that you are helping them make decisions by saying well we have engaged with the patient population and that can again kind of have that con conversation approach to finding a solution i agree so it's a bespoke approach i guess depending on your disease area the benefit risk burden on the patient and, and yeah I, I agree it's an iterative discussion uh, one for you anna on the anatomy um is the inner ear a closed system um how, how do you control dosage for middle ear injections well, the inner ear is quite close, so that's good. Uh, and in particular, when like for the gene therapies, you take a surgical approach um, into the inner ear. But most of the, the pharmaceutical approaches, they so far have been delivered, delivered to the middle ear. And then um, we see that there is um, that these these compounds, these these drugs, they um, go through the round window into the inner ear, but that process is 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 quite variable, uh, and that has affected uh, some of our trials. The other thing is the middle ear is is certainly not a closed system. It's very much an open system with the eustachian tube connected to the back of our nose, and um, so we try to overcome that by uh, using uh, formulations that are. Uh, liquid in room temperature and turn into a gel uh, as soon as they um, go to body temp temperature. And the idea is that when you when you when um, the formulation turns into a gel, it it stays contained into into the middle ear and has time to transfuse through that uh, round window into the the um, inner ear. But it's it's a variable process. And um, I think there is room for improvement. So some of the companies are currently developing delivery devices that that overcome some of that uh, variability. And we're here doing work with robotics, with imaging, where we can get more control of where we where we where we put the drug. Brilliant. Thank you for that detailed answer. I want to leave enough time for, for the charity and PAG question, which I'll come back to Kate on. But Vasily, can you give us some thoughts about new drug development beyond genetics? I think I've got an idea of why we started with genetics, but what, what other approaches are we thinking of? Yeah, that goes back to the earlier question. So what would be the next big thing, right? So I think uh, addressing genetic causes of hearing loss helps us in one essential thing is we better understand the biology of the inner ear, right? And what are the important components and what are important biological factors that contribute to hearing. That can help us tackle progressively other conditions. And I think one big goal for a lot of companies working in this space is to address age-related hearing loss where, you know, at some point we will be able, you know, to maybe administer factors that will help with reducing the loss of inner hair cells or even promote the regeneration of inner hair cells. And then we're not talking about, you know, a small fraction of, of, of people with that. We are talking about every single one of us, 
right? And so that's the big, I would say, topic that all the companies in the field want, want to develop. But certainly starting from genetic causes of hearing loss help us understand the biology, which is the first step moving forward. Thank you. So and, come... but one more thing, a lot of people also work on autoprotection because we know a number of you know, toxic compounds or factors that reduce hearing over time. And, and I think the, the understandings on what underpins these mechanisms uh, have driven in the recent years development of molecules that can counter some toxic effects of some chemotherapies, for instance. And that has been shown that, that we have now drugs are in clinical trials that work very, very well, beautifully well to counter the, the effects of cisplatin that a lot of oncology patients are receiving, they're losing hearing and nobody's paying attention because actually they're fighting for their lives. But that can be easily prevented because we have now medications that we know how to prevent these toxic effects in the inner ear. So I think that's another aspect that will be developed more and more in the upcoming years. Great point. And, and Kate, I'd like you to help us um, with your commentary on this last question here. Do you have any tips on how to build relationships with banks and charities? Um, how do we motivate charities to support with recruitment? So um, based on my conversations with charities and the Association of Medical Research Charities, is this is an area that they're ambitious to do. So it, it's finding, I suppose it's doing some legwork and finding who, who is in your domain, who's interested in your, your area. And creating a partnership way of working, I think, it, rather than transactional, and that can be the challenge sometimes, whether, whether you're a charity or whether you're a leading expert in X around the world, you can get to the point where people just come to you and take from you. And it's more productive if it's if it's a two-way way conversation. So establishing those early, we keep on saying this, this is a theme or an organ, contact, you know, make contact early, have an early conversation, make sure that feedback is implemented, these kind of things, showing that there is an impact from the engagement that leads to whether it's prioritization of the trial out those there is outcome measures that you choose that are meaningful all these kind of things are talking about going to the right people at the right time so it i think they are ambitious to do recruitment i think they're also very ambitious in terms of doing diverse recruitment um, and i think that's part of the motivation that is wanting to see that along the line these interventions get adopted and we know there's a health economics element to that kind of assessment and that kind of as we picked up earlier it being meaningful to patients, those quality of life outcomes. So making sure that you get those right patients through, you've had those conversations with charities as those brokers early and showing that you can deliver on that relationship down the line and feeding back. So conversation we haven't sort of touched on is we always talk about dissemination, open access, findings of research, going back to participants, saying thank you very much for participating. This is what we learnt. Motivates and might get your next recruits to your subsequent trials, I see charities as completely part of that dissemination process and going back to them. So being a good, doing that part, building a partnership way of working, going away from transaction, not being, I've got to go to an ethics committee in six weeks time. Can you get someone to look at my information sheet? Thank you. And not doing anything else, broadening that way you can do it. So for me and my job, my very first conversations are always extremely wide ranging. I call them scoping conversations and we have, it's nothing get action from that first conversation. It is just going, what are all the possibilities from the practical and the small to the blue sky? Find out where you each are, manage expectations and make sure that you sort of follow through. So very relationship based rather than practical, but I hope that helps. Thank you for that answer. Um, I think that's, allowed us to answer all of the Q&A. So I really want to thank the panel for the really engaging conversation and expertise that you've displayed here. I've learned a lot today and hopefully it's been interesting to the audience too. So thank you to them for their attendance. As a hand back to Sam. Yeah, thank you. Let me echo Mehul and say thank you to our panel. Um, I thought it was a really uh, excellent conversation and hopefully really helpful to the audience to pay attention. Um, so just to uh, wrap up, I want to let people know about opportunities for um, engaging with the BIA in future. 
So in, on the 25th of June, we have another webinar, this one looking at the general election in the UK and what we can expect to see. Um, following that, Women in Biotech, uh, our, our, our event series will be in Bristol and we will be in Glasgow. Um, and again, the, uh, the Glasgow event will be looking at the Scottish Life Science uh, Trials ecosystem. So if you've, um, if you've enjoyed this uh, conversation and you'd like to have another conversation, please do join us in Glasgow. Um, after that, we have the summer party and then we move into our uh, autumn event series. So please do visit the BIA uh, uh, website for more information. And yeah, we hope to see uh, more of you in the future. Um, you can also sign up to Newscast, our um, uh, weekly newsletter, which will kind of keep you up to date with what's going on in the, uh, in the ecosystem. And if you scan that QR code on your screen um, or you know, go back to the recording and catch it if you, if you miss it now, you can uh, find out much more about RNID. Um, so yeah, let me thank the panel again and thank RNID for helping us with this, uh, this webinar and this year. Uh, and yeah, thank you everyone.